Helps if I unmute myself. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's meeting. Um, as you saw when you joined, uh, this meeting is being recorded. <clears throat> Before we get started, I want to uh, do our land recognition. We uh, honor the indigenous communities native to the chapter area, including the Pagusset, Wepawag, Quinnipiac, Tocket, Nunkatuck, and Hammonasset people. As we advocate for conservation of the land and its wildlife, we're indebted to the work of native and indigenous people who cherished the land for thousands of years before European colonization. And uh, tonight we have Pat Lynch uh, talking to us about uh, his latest uh, discoveries for uh, his field guide to uh, the mid-Atlantic states. Um, Pat is an author, illustrator, photographer, artist. See his books and you uh, realize what a fantastic author, illustrator, photographer, and artist that he is. He worked for Yale for 45 years in various positions uh, dealing with um, media and the medical fields. And he's written, in addition to his latest book, he's written numerous other ones, Field Guides to Cape Cod, uh, Long Island Sound. And uh, he's, he got his start, I think, with uh, a field guide to the Southeast Coast and Gulf of Mexico, which he co-wrote with uh, the late um, Noble Proctor. So, uh, Pat, welcome. And uh, you can share your screen and uh, get started. I would ask everyone okay. to make sure that you remain muted. Thanks. Are you seeing my PowerPoints? Not really sure. We're seeing the edit screen. Uh, okay, let's see if this works again. Presenter mode. Yep. There we go. Okay, we there? Oh, yeah, wonderful. Terrible beauty. Sorry Thank about you. that. <laughs> it's a, sort of a tradition in Zoom to have share issues. Well, anyway, thanks very much for having me here. I've been lucky enough over the past few years to be uh, um, to have made a lot of different trips down to the mid-Atlantic coast, and I thought I'd share some observations about that. Uh, 
mostly about the climate issues that I've seen, but also I would hate that to, to have anyone leave this talk with, um, with any uh, hesitance about visiting the coast. It's absolutely beautiful down there. And I'd certainly urge you to, um, uh, to head down to the, um, uh, these natural areas, some of which are very well known, especially to birders, uh, Cape May, Brigantine, Forsyth, um, a lot of the larger National Wildlife Refuges, the Jersey Shore, which is heavily built up, but does have some beautiful areas. And of course, the Outer Banks. Um, it's probably one of my favorite places to, to visit. Uh, we love the Outer Banks. We've made lots of family trips down there. And also um, uh, the, um, the more mid-Atlantic coast is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, you'll see a lot of pictures of Assateague uh, National Seashore because I just fell in love with the place. Um, some of the more common birds down there, but it's just a birder's paradise. And it's interesting, it's a coast of what I would call transitions. It, uh, in some ways, it's remarkably similar. I was just at Race Point a couple of days ago, and from Race Point all the way down to Cape Hatteras, there is a remarkably consistent coastal pine barrens forest uh, habitat all the way through. And a lot of the dune habitats share many, many of the same plants and animals. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the coast changes a great deal. I'm always struck as soon as I'm south of New York City, uh, and especially uh, uh, down near the Chesapeake, that things start to feel relatively tropical compared to what we're used to in New England. Um, even down, say, in the mid-New Jersey coast, uh, Barnegat Inlet, uh, in the wintertime, um, it can be absolutely brutal freezing, and uh, but it's a very popular uh, birding destination around Barnegat Light because among many, many other seabirds, you can see remarkably harlequin ducks. It's one of the, the best places, certainly south of Long Island, to see harlequins. Um, and the same coast further down uh, toward the Outer Banks, certainly south of Chesapeake Bay, you start seeing what I still think of, um, even though I've seen them lots of different places, uh, uh, as, as tropical Florida type birds, white ibises and, and saw palmettos um, uh, under the trees and things like that begin to have an almost a Northern Florida sort of feel. For us in New England, uh, it's a very, very different sort of coast. It's very low, very sandy. There's virtually no exposed bedrock that I can think of anywhere between uh, Northern New Jersey and uh, certainly um, uh, Florida, uh, there's some exposed coral, uh, coral rock along the coast, but, but basically it's a sandy low coast. Uh, it extends down um, uh, the seaboard uh, and it's the, the, the coastal component. Um, my book is not really about the, the mid-Atlantic coastal plain, although I've, I've shown it in some of the maps here for orientation but um, it's, it's the coastal parts of that. So Delaware Bay, the southern saltier parts of Chesapeake Bay, et cetera, uh, and down the coast here. You're gonna hear me mention Assateague a lot. Um, Assateague Island is a long barrier island that extends down through the Maryland uh, coast and, and actually crosses the Virginia border for uh, the lower part of it. Chincoteague, of course, is very famous for its ponies, but there are ponies throughout Assateague. And if there's one place I would recommend you visiting, it's the Assateague National Seashore. That would be the part of the island which is in Maryland North. Um, uh, uh, you'll, <laughs> they, you'll still see ponies there, but um, I found it to be my absolute favorite place. It's like a distillation of everything that I love about the mid-Atlantic coast. So the mid-Atlantic coast um, originated in all of its low sandy glory, uh, basically from the erosion of the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachians uh, have um, in the beginning a very stormy history, 250 million or more years ago. They were as high as the Rocky Mountains and were a very geologically active area due to subduction 
um, uh, when um, uh, Pangea came together about 250 million years ago. It was a big crunch. It raised the ancestral Appalachians. And, um, uh, but then as, as about 150 million years ago, as Pangea began to pull apart and the Atlantic Ocean began to form, uh, the coast became what geologists call a, a trailing coast or a following coast. There's no subduction. There's no um, uh, great geologic activity as we see, for example, on the west coast of the U.S., it's all about erosion and has been for the last 150 million years. And that's where our coast came from. The mountains used to be very much higher, but they've been eroding um, for 250 million years. And they built up this huge uh, coastal shelf of basically sedimentary rock. They're nowhere along the coast. Is there any exposed bedrock? Um, uh, down, uh, this is kind of representative of the Outer Banks or some of the more southern barrier islands. And they've been this way for um, 250 million years. And the bedrock of the coast can be as much as 10,000 feet below the surface. So very, very different coastline than New England. 25,000 years ago, uh, the coast was almost unrecognizable. Um, up here, New York City and north of New York City and Long Island, uh, the uh, Laurentide Glacier, which you can think of as a kind of giant, gigantic extension of the polar ice gap, uh, had buried virtually all of New England. And there was so much of the Earth's water bound up in those uh, polar ice cap extensions that the sea level was as much as 400 feet lower than it is today. So all of this coastal um, uh, shelf um, out beyond the current shoreline, which I've shown in bright green, was all land. And it was not like land uh, today. It would have been 25,000 years ago, more like what you'd see in Nova Scotia or the Canadian Maritimes, very much colder environment than today. And immediately along what was then the coast, the edge of the continental shelf, you would have seen things that look more like what you'd see on the Outer Cape, uh, scrub, pitch pine scrub, et cetera, very fire prone. We know all this mostly because of pollen studies that have been done, but because those coastal areas were also very fire prone, um, uh, geologists often find um, uh, uh, carbon deposits from, from the burning of those forests. And, uh, and that cool, uh, temperate and northern temperate forests extended uh, 25,000 years ago all the way down to northern Florida. So very different landscape um, in 25,000 years from a geological point of view is a blink of an eye. So it's amazing uh, the changes that have happened in just that time. We see on our mid-Atlantic coast uh, bits and pieces of a chain of barrier islands that is remarkably consistent in structure and is the longest in the world. Nowhere in the world has a longer chain, a more substantial chain of barrier islands. So it's very, very characteristic of our coast. And those barrier islands and barrier peninsulas have a remarkably consistent structure enforced by uh, the waves and the wind. Uh, and, and what can grow, as I'll explain in a few minutes, um, uh, under assault from, from salt aerosols all the time. It's, it's the salt aerosols, what in common parlance, salt spray, that determines a lot of what you see along the coast. Uh, so primary dunes here, maritime grasslands, uh, ponds are common along the coast. Um, and in the larger uh, barrier, there are small pockets of coastal forest. Uh, tends to be that kind of pitch pine, loblolly pine coastal forest, some of which can be very substantial if they've been there for a long time, like in St. Eggs Head Woods on the Outer Banks. And then uh, a sheltered bay or sound behind them, uh, which is basically a big estuary. These freshwater rivers flow in and, and reduce the saltiness. Uh, and, and although um, only a small subset of marine organisms can exist within estuaries, the key to estuary productivity is there may be a small number of species, but they can exist there in gigantic numbers. Think menhaden, think blue crabs, uh, think alewives, things like that, or at least before we 
um, ruined all their rivers and polluted them. But um, uh, so a closer view here of barrier islands, you're going to hear me refer when we start talking about built up areas along the coast to overwash fans. All of these areas show geologically these overwash fans and they are absolutely critical to the life of a barrier island because that's where the new sand comes from. That's how barrier islands get built up over centuries in response to sea level rise. They are able to persist and our current barrier islands are at least 5,000, 6,000 years old uh, because of overwash fans. Um, and, and it's basically uh, uh, high storm tides push huge amounts of sand onto the barrier island. It smothers what's beneath them, but it's, it's the life of the island. It's how islands are able to persist over time. And you see overwash fans all throughout, including in our very, very, very much smaller uh, um, uh, uh, sandy and salt marsh habitats around here. Um, so barrier islands move. This was uh, probably thousands of years ago a coastal forest that was on the inland side of uh, the Outer Banks. And the whole island has rolled over um, uh, toward the left um, in this photograph. And it's exposed this old forest um, uh, of tree stumps was once a thick coastal forest, got smothered by sand and sand overwashes over time. The island has retreated uh, because of sea level rise, but it's still intact. It has just slid over a bit. That's how wild barrier islands and barrier peninsulas persist over thousands of years. And um, as we'll talk about when we talk about developed islands, we've basically cut off that process. And so that can cause a whole lot of trouble. Um, as I say, that the the coast is largely governed, especially what you see in terms of the, the physical structure of the islands and what can grow on them by sand and salt. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, what um, geologists call spin drift. That is uh, a blowing uh, wind has blown off these droplets of waves over uh, uh, water over the top of these waves. That is not salt spray, as, as I will uh, explain. Salt spray is a very, very fine mist of salt that per, can blow inland for miles and is not the same as getting splashed when you're right at the, uh, right at the edge of um, breaking waves on a beach. Um, and it's the salt aerosols that largely govern the very, very consistent structure that you see. There's only a, um, a, a relatively small number of plants that can exist on barrier islands anywhere near direct contact with salt spray. So this is a profile from the ocean side working through uh, um, uh, sea oats and beach grass and all the kinds of things that can, that can withstand fairly direct exposure to salt. Um, and then there are pitch pines and, and loblolly pines and other kinds of shrubs that can also uh, have various mechanisms of surviving salt exposure. And this is classic. Um, you get wedge-shaped forests um, uh, in proportion to the amount of salt spray that they have to survive. And then in the relatively sheltered areas on the bay side, you have um, uh, more normal, um, uh, thicker shrub areas and, and these huge salt marshes that are characteristic of the mid-Atlantic coast and all the plants and animals that, that make those things up, which are remarkably consistent. So when you go to the coast, people talk about what they see as being very windswept, especially the trees, windswept trees. Um, it's not the wind that's acting on those trees and actively shaping them. Salt aerosols uh, are formed when the bazillions of little bubbles in an active coast burst at the surface and produce microscopic droplets of uh, salt water, which then get blown in. So e even when on the beach, your car windshield, your camera, your sunglasses, all kinds of things, 
get coated with a fine coating of salt. It's not splashing from the waves. It's these salt aerosols blowing inland. And when they hit a plant, they begin to kill uh, even relatively hardy plants uh, exposed to lots of salt aerosol begin to die. Um, and as they die, as the more exposed parts of the plant uh, die off because of uh, the sheer volume of salt they're exposed to, they acquire this windswept appearance. And as I said, salt aerosols, unlike the splashing from waves and spindrift, can blow miles inland. And so they tend to govern almost everything you see uh, in terms of the vegetation um, uh, on these barrier islands and coastal areas. Um, when I was looking at the history of the coast, I'm, I'm very into environmental history. It seems to me that uh, a field guide should give you a sense of why things ended up the way they are and not just a catalog of names, but how did what you see come to be? And one of the things that struck me, the sort of main themes when I looked at the environmental history of the coast is uh, we think of the coast today in terms that on a person in the 17, 1800s would barely recognize, certainly the early 1800s. We think of the coast as a gorgeous uh, uh, wildlife areas, uh, uh, playgrounds, uh, beaches, resorts, et cetera. That's not how uh, our, um, the coasts were viewed even for 250 years or more after European contact and the first colonial, colonial sediments. It was really the inland estuaries, relatively in, inland estuaries like New York Harbor is a, a giant wild estuary, uh, Delaware Bay, and especially Chesapeake Bay, that um, uh, early American history tends to be driven by a lot of events that occurred in New England, but New England was not the driver of American development for the first hundreds uh, of years. It was really the incredible riches of the areas around the Chesapeake. And, and this was an absolute key factor. The Chesapeake is deep for hundreds of miles inland. And so these big transatlantic ships could go all the way up to Baltimore uh, and, and beyond uh, and, and um, up many, many of the, the big rivers, the James, the Chowan, um, uh, other coastal rivers. And that was absolutely critical to development at a point where there were no roads. Um, and and even, even after a century or two, uh, the roads remained fairly primitive. And so it was an enormous advantage to the development of the American continent uh, that, that the Chesapeake and the Delaware and the, the Hudson estuary allowed deep water ships to move so far inland. Uh, but the coast was very isolated uh, because it was very dangerous. You remember that wreck um, uh, 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 painting that I showed you a few minutes ago. The, uh, from a deep water sailor's point of view, uh, the mid-Atlantic coast was mostly a nightmare of shifting sand soul, uh, shoals, uh, uh, virtually no natural, uh, natural harbors, inlets that had treacherous currents. And so the coast, which we now think of as an incredibly popular um, uh, wildlife area and playground, uh, was very, very isolated for centuries, certainly um, up until the middle of the 1800s, it was a pretty wild and isolated place. Uh, it's, <laughs> um, you can't get away from ponies if you're talking about the mid-Atlantic coast, people love them. And uh, there are all sorts of, um, I think, pretty ridiculous myths about how they got there. Spanish galleons wrecked along the coast and stuff like that. I mean, if you think about it, it's nonsense. Uh, the last thing that a galleon captain uh, heading, uh, coming up the coast to catch the Gulf Stream would want to do is load up his ship for a, what could be a three month voyage back to Spain with huge animals that eat a lot. They didn't carry the ponies back there. The reason we have ponies on the Outer Banks and, and Assateague Island, the Chincoteague area, et cetera, was basically tax evasion. Uh, back in colonial times and early American times, if you had a herd of 
uh, ponies or horses, they were taxed per capita. So if you wanted to both uh, provide your horses and cattle and sheep with rich grazing areas and, and get them far away from the tax man, you put them out on the islands. And the cows and the sheep didn't survive, but horses are particularly well uh, adapted for that. And um, uh, because of the difficulties of uh, very few natural uh, natural harbors, et cetera, the, uh, the offshore waters in the mid-Atlantic are incredibly rich, but they uh, probably until the 1900s and uh, motor power, uh, uh, those riches were not tapped as much as they were, say, in New England and the Outer Banks and, and George's Bank, et cetera. Uh, because although there were many, many fish out there, they were not easy to get to in, in certainly in sailing vessels. Uh, we all know, of course, about the warm Gulf Stream that comes up and curves off the coast at Cape Hatteras, but there is also a, a continuation of the Labrador current that comes all the way down the coast. These two currents collide off Cape Hatteras which is one of the reasons that makes it so difficult and dangerous for sailors. But um, along that um, collision line, there are incredible biological riches. These uh, hot areas, the reds and, and yellows, et cetera, are densities of marine life. And it's one of the reasons, well, we recognize them now, certainly the, the, the rich life off Georgia's bank, et cetera, but all along the shelf, and um, extending out in the Gulf Stream, there are incredibly rich uh, uh, marine wildlife areas. So not just the fish, but um, uh, marine mammals and seabirds, et cetera, are out there. Um, one of the things that's very heartening, there's lots of bad news you can talk about um, for the Middle Atlantic coast, but one of the really good um, uh, uh, things that have happened recently is uh, much more aggressive protections for uh, fridge fish. That is the small uh, fish species, things like menhaden and, and, um, and, and herring and other filter feeders which uh, uh, are the base of the marine food chain are absolutely critical, not only for uh, wildlife along the coast like ospreys and, and bald eagles, but um, the marine mammals, the dolphins, et cetera. We're starting to see many more marine animals around us in Connecticut uh, because of uh, the survival now of a lot of these menhaden things. So all of these species have in common the fact that they are filter feeders. They feed directly on the small, uh, th that is physically small, but, but they exist in gigantic numbers, uh, the base of the food chain. So they are the translation between uh, what um, most uh, larger animals can eat, predatory fish, sport fish, et cetera. And, uh, and, and the base of the food chain. So they're absolutely critical um, uh, to survival. And uh, it's almost unbelievably productive, some of the areas along the coast. Uh, Frank Gallo, local birder who um, many of you know, and I walked over uh, um, the primary dune line at Cochina Beach in the Outer Banks a couple of years ago and saw this. I mean, we were just flabbergasted. Uh, it's, it, this is just a small portion of the uh, uncountable thousands of double-crested cormorants that happened to have converged in, uh, I think it was um, early May of that year along the coast. There must have been incredible uh, uh, bait fish, forward fish schools off, uh, uh, um, just offshore. And this is about four miles north of the inlet. And it looked like this all the way down as far as the eye could see with binoculars it is just um, a, this kind of density. It was a, like a black gray line all the way down the coast. It was just amazing uh, how productive these areas can be. So uh, beaches may not always look all that productive, but if you look at the total productivity and look at the beach and the near or as one ecological system, they can be staggeringly productive. So the coasts, uh, I describe them in, in my book as a lost coast. 
Uh, they were hard to get to. There were very few roads. Uh, as I've described before, the, uh, a sandy coast with lots of shoals is very unfriendly to uh, uh, large ships and small boats. And so the coasts were relatively isolated, but starting in the mid 1800s, the cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore and New York and Northern New Jersey areas got so dense with people that um, uh, people started looking to the shoreline for some relief, particularly in the summertime. In uh, 1849, I think it was, a group of Philadelphia investors went out to the New Jersey coast and found a small uh, barrier island called Absecon Island and, uh, and decided that if they built a railway to it from Philadelphia, that they might be able to attract tourists uh, who would come out, mm, uh, maybe not for the day, but certainly for short stays out there. And they built a group of hotels, uh, a tiny at first group of hotels, and they called it Atlantic City. And um, that kicked off a huge boom. Soon there were two railroad lines, uh, both upgraded, very crowded, and Atlantic City and many of the um, cities along, particularly the Jersey Shore, have been booming ever since then. Uh, what really kicked off the coastal boom is World War II and uh, later subsequent development of transportation along the coast. So all those bunkers that you see in places, places like Cape May, the observation towers, et cetera, that all came in with World War II. And in order to reach those coastal installations, the government had to build new roads and bridges. And suddenly a coast that was very isolated for hundreds of years started to become accessible to people. And after World War II, you had things uh, like uh, the Garden State Parkway in the late 1950s was built uh, that parallels the Jersey shoreline. The Jersey shore before um, the Garden State Parkway wasn't very accessible because you had to go down Route 1, there were traffic nightmares, et cetera. So they very cleverly built the road about um, two miles inland from the coast. And suddenly the Jersey Shore was incredibly accessible to Northern New Jersey and Philadelphia and uh, New York City. And it was off to the races after that. Um, and uh, um, now the New Jersey coast is of course, incredibly uh, well-developed. Um, Atlantic City looks a little bit different than it did in 1849. Uh, and um, these big ocean resorts like Atlantic City, like many, many of the smaller uh, uh, Jersey shore towns, uh, Ocean City in Maryland, et cetera, it's um, have been built up to the point where <laughs> the beach is almost irrelevant to everything else. Uh, but all of these things are built on sandy barrier islands. And we know it's coming when you build on islands that are barely above sea level. So everyone remembers Superstorm Sandy, uh, but there have been hurricanes along this mid-Atlantic coast since uh, we started recording hurricanes. Uh, you can see the density of tracks there and, and, the, and the, the peak of around, statistically around September 10th for the track of storms there. So none of the disasters that are coming are, should be a surprise to anybody. Storms are getting uh, stronger and more frequent. And we've got good data about that. It used to be that you had to ritually, when you talked about particularly individual storms like Superstorm Sandy, you had to sort of ritually say, weather is not climate and it's hard to ascribe uh, climate change to you know, any particular coastal storm. Well, the data is a lot tighter than that now. And now we can say that uh, storms are getting bigger and more dangerous and there's more of them. Uh, uh, almost certainly because of uh, the heating of the environment. And the storms are changing as well because of all that heat uh, that's coming in from offshore. Uh, Hurricane Florence was devastating to North Car Southern North Carolina and South Carolina. It, um, people say it was only a category one, but it was a category one that sat over the coast for 
48 hours and 40 inches of rain, more than a meter of rain dropped in that time. And that's typical of a lot of the recent hurricanes that we've seen. It's almost as if we need another way of describing the severity of hurricanes because the, the heating climate has made the storm so much wetter. So everybody's seen some variation of this chart of sea level rise. And I have to keep remaking it. Uh, I think this is probably the fourth version I've made because the worst case scenario keeps getting worse. Uh, um, the main mainstream scenarios are the, the kind of orange one in the middle. Uh, but, but even that is now considered to be optimistic uh, in 2000 uh, or you know, 2021. One thing that you always see about these things, it's sort of peculiar, is they all end at 2100, as if something wonderful and magical uh, would happen in 2100. Uh, and, but um, nothing magical is going to happen. We know from lots of uh, uh, periods of, of climate cycles in the geologic record, we know pretty much what happens when, you, when the earth warms uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade. Uh, we get roughly a 65 feet of sea level rise. It happens slowly, especially in terms of the human lifetime, but it's important to understand when people look at sea level rise is we're not talking about four feet over the next century. Uh, we're talking about roughly 65 feet over the next several centuries. And that's baked in. It's going to happen almost no matter what we do. If by some miracle we could bring the temperature rise down to no degrees centigrade, we'd still see sea level rise for centuries. And it's important when you're trying to plan in human scales uh, about what happens along the coast to remember that this is not going to go away. Uh, we could ban all um, uh, uh, carbon sources tomorrow and we would still see a relatively relentless, geologically very fast rise in sea levels. And we haven't learned much of anything. This is Wildwood, New Jersey. This is a sandy barrier island, just like the ones I've been showing you, except that um, all the wilderness has been bulldozed out a very long time ago. But there is nothing in Wildwood uh, with urban levels of, of housing density uh, that is more than seven feet above sea level. So it was as bad as Sandy's was, these areas along the Jersey coast actually lucked out because of the way, the counterclockwise way that storms spin. The fact that Sandy went a bit north and hit northern New Jersey means that a lot of these coasts were spared. Uh, uh, the, the, the severe storm surges that the in northern New Jersey areas hit. If it had hit here, none of this would exist. This is the town of Corolla on the Outer Banks, it's in, probably the, the northernmost built up town on the Outer Banks. I shot this photo from the top of the, of, of the White House in Corolla. And um, this is what it looks like. Uh, the, it's, it's no higher than Wildwood, New Jersey. There's no ground level here that's more than about 10 feet. Uh, even a category two storm would make matchwood of this whole area and then wash it out to sea. Uh, because of the storm surge. And yet they are still building relentlessly. And the corker about understanding how reckless a town like Corolla is, is that there is one two lane road for about in the summertime, 50,000 people. And by two lane, I don't mean two on one side and two on the other. I mean, one lane going north and one lane going south. So it would take days and days of bumper to bumper traffic to evacuate uh, a, a town like Corolla. And yet they keep on building. So um, there's lots of trouble ahead. Heat isn't just uh, a matter of sea level rise. It changes other things as well. And probably one of the best known examples is it screws up the timing of things that, that are incredibly important to species like the red knot, which make these incredible journeys from like down in Tierra del Fuego 
uh, uh, up in the springtime, uh, tens of thousands of miles. And one of the main places they stop for rest and, and to basically to kind of restore their energy, some of the birds double their weight uh, um, uh, uh, when they rest in the Delaware Bay areas that, uh, and the critical food source there is the spring spawning and egg laying of horseshoe crabs. Uh, but because of the warmer weather, the synchronization between the red knot migration and the horseshoe crabs has gotten screwed up. And um, uh, they're continuing to drift out of sync. So on top of all the other environmental challenges that shorebirds like red knots are facing, the warming environment is screwing up the timing of things. Red, red knots are a, a very good example, but you find um, a, a legion of examples in terms of pollinators and when flowering happens and all that sort of stuff. So there are the obvious um, temperature thermometer level effects of sea level rise and, and the warming climate, but there are all kinds of more subtle issues that, um, uh, that cause problems along the coast. One of which is um, uh, the, the sea level rise is salt infiltration. Lately in the past, uh, probably a month or two, you started to see, if you pay attention to environmental news, lots more references to ghost forests and Maya Lin did an installation on them and things that, that's down in New York City now. But um, salt infiltration is something that you see everywhere along the coast. And you can stand there and think, oh, this is a gorgeous environment and it's just full of birds. And, and this is, this is um, Assateague National Seashore on the bay side. Uh, but if you look carefully, um, all of the larger trees are dead or dying. Uh, because of salt infiltration. They used to be thriving. Uh, this is probably a black cherry. There are dead um, um, uh, marsh elders and things like that along the coast. And you see uh, dead cedars um, all the time. These, um, this is, these trees are not leafless uh, uh, because uh, uh, of seasonal activity. They should be full of leaves. They aren't because they're dead or dying. And you can see the previous dead and dying trees all along the coast here because of salt infiltration. Um, sea level rise is especially bad along the uh, mid-Atlantic coast for, they almost have, and it's worse than a trifecta of bad effects. One is that the ice in the ice age pressed down New England and like a teeter-totter, the mid-Atlantic coast rose, that, that part of the, the geologic plate rose and the ice went away, um, pretty much was gone by about 15,000 years ago. And ever since then, the mid-Atlantic coast has been settling back to what would uh, have been geologically a more normal level. So that's part of the problem uh, that they have. One thing that's not well known outside of the lower Chesapeake area is there was a huge meteor strike 35 million years ago in that area. And that causes problems with um, land subsidence because it basically made gravel out of the bedrock underneath this area. And so it sinks faster than other places. And one of the things I learned from doing a book that I never realized before, although I was reasonably familiar with the area, is that the Norfolk Virginia Beach area is by far the most um, dense, heavily populated area in Virginia, way more, for example, than Washington. And with all those people, you need water. And there are no uh, obvious surface water sources anywhere along here. So they've been pumping huge amounts of groundwater out of the ground. And when you do that, the ground sinks. So uh, our sea level rise, say, in the Connecticut coast is more like four millimeters or so. That's typical. Their sea level rise is much higher than that, 5.2 in some cases more, because this is constellation of bad effects. And the, uh, there's another effect that's not on this map, which is the Gulf Stream is slowing down. And if that doesn't give you chills in the pit of your stomach, um, nothing should. Um, the Gulf Stream is slowing down. And uh, as uh, almost certainly due to long-term climate change and 
as that fast moving stream slows down, it doesn't pull as much water away from the coast. Now the effects is subtle, it's, it's in terms of millimeters, but nevertheless, in sea level rise, every millimeter counts. And the fact that the Gulf Stream is flowing slower than it did before is another problem that they have with sea level rise along the coast. Um, this is black water. It's about halfway up the Chesapeake Bay. It's still uh, fairly salty, brackish water uh, uh, and very tidal, probably three or four foot tides, uh, even though it's along the Maryland shore. That area, it's, it's a gorgeous area, um, uh, great for birding, just awesome for waterfowl migration in the fall. Actually, just about any time of year, it's good. They lose in the Blackwater Reserve alone, 8,300 acres of wetlands every year. That's a combination of, of wetland flats, tidal flats, and salt marsh. Um, uh, to look at it another way, that's the equivalent of 11,000 football fields every year disappear because of sea level rise and the erosions of the marshes. So it's a gorgeous place to visit, but when you look at the details of the story, you see trouble all over the place. Um, when you visit these coastal resort towns, this is the Outer Banks down in Nags Head. Basically, these places exist uh, um, because of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They fund uh, and organize an awful lot of what's called beach nourishment. That is, as the sand erodes away, as it naturally does, uh, sand um, periodically every three, five, seven years is pumped back onto the beaches to maintain them so that the beach doesn't erode away and the houses don't end up in the surf. And also, when you go to these houses, it's easy to imagine that these dune lines uh, look relatively natural, but they're completely artificial and they're much higher than normal wild dune lines. Uh, they're built by bulldoz bulldozers and they're built specifically to prevent overwashes. So ironically, they're spending millions and millions of dollars, um, billions over the course of decades uh, to pump sand back on um, because they've shut off the natural mechanism of providing sand to barrier islands they shut off the overwash and, and now we have these completely artificial beaches. Basically anywhere you see a house this close to the coast, it's an artificial beach that at some point in the last few years has been nourished for offshore sand. And these dunes are um, entirely made by bulldozers. They have very often uh, completely natural vegetation on top of them to stabilize the sand but they're artificial. Everything you're, you're looking at here is artificial. So it's, it's not like visiting a natural, natural shore. This, I happen to have photographs of the before and after of this. Uh, I'm standing here on a well-known fishing pier in Nags Head called Jeanette's Pier, and I photographed the beach because why not? I'm standing on the pier. So I took some photos. A few months later, in a single night, the beach disappeared uh, from uh, a, a relatively minor nor'easter that probably nobody outside the Outer Banks even noticed. But all of that beach that you saw before was carved away, almost all of it. I just, um, I don't know how many millions of tons of sand disappeared offshore in one night. And this is what it looked like um, uh, the afternoon uh, after the storm. And um, it was, uh, now this doesn't happen every place all the time, thankfully, or we wouldn't have any developed coast. But what happened was um, normally the waves and the currents come in more or less perpendicular to the coast. It was particularly bad here because for a variety of reasons, the strong nearshore current um, was running parallel to the coast and it just carved away the whole beach in one night. This is what it looked like a few months later when I was back on the Outer Banks. So it's recovering, uh, but um, they're not gonna have the beach that they had before until it's re-nourished because it was all carved away in one night. Um, this is the, uh, a famous area of the Southern Nags Head. There's houses way out in the surf. Um, this house in the center here has long since been condemned, but it's still standing. It hasn't been knocked down. 
Uh, and these, it's important to understand what you're looking at here. This is not the kind of foolishness of building a 10,000 square foot luxury beach house um, uh, this close to the ocean, as you see in areas further north on, on the Outer Banks. Um, these houses were mostly built in the late 50s, early 60s. They're modest beach houses, maybe 1,000 to 1,300 square feet. And what's important to understand that when these houses were originally built, they were three streets back from the ocean. They had no ocean view. And if you could somehow stand where I stood to take this picture, you wouldn't see any ocean because the ocean would be way off to the right. Uh, and there would be neighborhood streets and, and other lines of houses on the right side there. Probably the original um, 19, late 1950s, early 60s uh, um, uh, uh, ground level was about where the house levels are now. now these have been raised um, over the half a century since they were built, but, um, but they weren't built this way. So when you look at these things, um, it's not a parable of people doing foolish things, at least in, in this area. It's basically people coping with the fact that they've got uh, virtually worthless houses that everybody knows will eventually be swallowed by the sea. And it's just a matter of time before they go away. Um, and in the meantime, the habitable ones, um, people enjoy. The sea rises everywhere along the coast, not just uh, the ocean coasts. So on um, uh, the outer banks, you've got um, sea level rise creeping in from both sides. This is Nags Head Woods, which is an absolutely gorgeous place um, in Nags Head, a huge coastal forest, natural area. And I'm baffled every time I go there. Um, they lose about three horizontal feet a year of, of coastline, um, even along this uh, um, uh, uh, Albemarle Sound area. Uh, and so every time I go there, I have to reorient myself because you follow this path through the woods, it comes out on the Sound shoreline and everything is different, even just in a couple of years because it's eroding so fast. Um, this is Prime Hook in, on Delaware Bay. And you see these kinds of ghost forests and dead trees all over the place. Again, Prime Hook is gorgeous. I, I strongly urge you to visit it if you can. Um, it's great for birding, but everywhere you look, if you know what to look for, you see signs of trouble. These dead trees along roadways and old dikes. This is on um, Assateague uh, Island in the National Seashore area. Uh, dead loblolly pine in the foreground, but um, the process of what's going on, it, you can see in this in this roadway, it was originally lined with loblolly pines, uh, probably half of which are sick and a third of which are already dead. Um, and the term of art is a ghost forest because it's going away so quickly. And it's due to saltwater infiltration, but Saltwater infiltration can have insidious effects. Everybody understands that if you pour salt water on most plants, it, uh, they die because of the osmotic balance um, in the root systems just doesn't work and the plant um, shrivels and dies. Um, what's not so obvious and what is happening in a lot of salt infiltration areas is that in large volume, salt water is much heavier than fresh water. And so the salt infiltration pushes up the freshwater ground table and, um, and the roots drown in freshwater. Uh, it's, it's a part of the saltwater infiltration thing. And um, the combination of, of um, more severe storms, this is, um, and, and salt infiltration and sea level rise are doing away with a lot of uh, uh, the, our most beautiful marshes. Uh, 20 years ago, everything, virtually everything you see here would have been salt marsh, high or low salt marsh. In Sandy destroyed the barrier island that is just off Prime Hook's uh, uh, um, uh, exposure to Delaware Bay, and the marshes got flooded and they're quickly eroding away. So still a gorgeous place to visit, still very attractive to wildlife. Uh, but if you know what you're looking at, you see these dead trees and salt infiltration. Um, and uh, marsh erosion all over the place. Uh, 
but it's a gorgeous place. I would, um, uh, you know, it would be tragic if I convinced you that it's not a good place to go. It's a gorgeous coast. It's going to be a gorgeous coast for a long time. Um, Assateague, I would strongly urge you to visit it ended up being my favorite place along the mid-Atlantic coast. Uh, everything is very accessible. It's a distillation of uh, uh, gorgeous beaches and large dune areas and coastal forest areas and salt marshes that are very, very accessible. Um, if you uh, um, can't do many mile hikes and things like that, Assateague is, is ideal for you because probably it would be hard to find one mile of walking that you could do on Assateague and, and generally much less. It's got nice boardwalks and other things to facilitate that. And I'd especially recommend it in the fall. This is Chincoteague uh, National Wildlife Area. It's, it's the Southern end of Assateague Island that's down in the Virginia area. Um, uh, most birders still know this place as, uh, as Brigantine, the Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge in New Jersey is an absolutely gorgeous place to visit. Um, and uh, the marshes, the brackish marshes in, uh, on the sound side of the Outer Banks, everybody usually shows you the ocean sides of the Outer Banks, but the sound sides uh, can be just as gorgeous. And luckily there's still a fair number of wild areas that you can visit that haven't been built over, um, even in the Outer Banks. Um, Cape May, of course, is one of the most famous birding areas in the country. Uh, and um, uh, these are bottlenoses. I went down to uh, um, uh, Assateague before dawn uh, just to get some sunset photos. And um, this pod of bottlenose, actually it was a whole parade of them, continuous parade of them came by just, um, just offshore. So it's a beautiful place to visit, but there are lots of problems down there. And um, it's sort of a microcosm of, of what we will face in the future. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions. I defer to Dennis on that. We do have time for a few questions. If you have questions, okay. I'd be uh, happy to answer questions. Unmute yourself and uh, can, you, can you stop the screen sharing, Pat? Oh, I'm still sharing? Yes. Okay. We'll get everybody here uh, now. Stop okay. sharing. Good. Okay. Good. But are there any questions? or comments. It was great. The pictures were great and the presentation was great. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. Very informative I program, Patrick. Very informative. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I see Jeff Spendolo is out there. Um, he'll probably tell me all the bird things I got wrong. <laughs> He's a very, very experienced coastal uh, um, wildlife biologist. Um, any other questions? Well known, comments? Well, Jeff's well known for the his work with Rosia Turns on Faulkner. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, originated the Turn projects on Faulkner yes. Island uh, decades ago. Um, well, okay. I am. Going question. To, I'm going, no, I'm going to pull, yes, a question, but unrelated to this. I'm pulling this from my friend, David Lindo. What is your favorite bird? Uh, brown pelican, uh, certainly along that coast. I, I just find them fascinating. You look at them and I, I know it's projection and it's sort of ridiculous, but they, they just look like old souls, even the young ones. Um, and I just love to watch them along the coast. Uh, they're just such magnificent flyers and divers um, that, uh, yeah, for sure, on the mid-Atlantic coast, brown pelican. All right. I have a, I think I have one quick question. Um, are you finding, do you know much about um, the garbage um, 
in the ocean around the mid-Atlantic coast? Um, any particular issues down there? Um, or is, is, is trash, um, sea trash congregating in that area? Not that I noticed particularly. Uh, I'm mostly thinking about wild coasts that aren't regularly groomed. I mean, you couldn't really tell in some of the built up areas, like maybe the, the houses, you know, along the shore and the outer banks and stuff, because those beaches, in addition to being nourished, get groomed pretty heavily. And so you might not notice a um, uh, 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 trash building up, but even in the wilder areas, say down in Pea Island and Hatteras Island, uh, oh, say the wild beaches um, in New Jersey, a uh, few that exist. Um, uh, uh, no, thankfully, I did not see a lot of trash. There's always lots of them along the beach in small amounts. Uh, most of it natural, actually. But uh, um, uh, unlike this other places in the world where you see horror stories of, of just huge rafts of, of plastic bottles and things along the coast, no, thankfully, I, I saw very little of that. Most of the trouble is climate, thankfully. Well, sort of thankfully, not trash. Bobby has a question in chat. Are we looking at the same sea level rise here in Connecticut? Uh, our sea level rise um, these days is about four millimeters a year, which is considerable. Four millimeters doesn't sound like so much, but four, um, four centimeters, you know, a decade, uh, starts to cause real trouble. Uh, not so much because of the vertical rise in things, but because of the horizontal distance that even a small amount of sea level rise changes things. Uh, many of the people in the audience know Milford Point um, fairly well and driving out to it. It's a very, very low part of the Milford coast and just millimeters of sea level rise have changed that area quite a bit over the last decade, even just the last decade. So uh, about four millimeters for us in some of the worst areas in the mid-Atlantic coast down around uh, Hampton Roads in that area, uh, it's over five millimeters. Well, four millimeters a year is an inch every six years. So that's pretty significant. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, it doesn't sound like much, you know, 1.5 degrees centigrade, four millimeters a year, doesn't sound overwhelming, uh, but it very quickly over time gets to be uh, a, a real problem along the coast, not just for human infrastructure and flooded roads and houses in danger and things like that, but um, as I said in the talk, huge effects on the natural environment as well. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Well, Hi. thanks very much for inviting me. Um, and, okay. Bye-bye. Uh, Check the website Wait, for, for our uh, so he has again. Oh. program. <laughs> uh, this is a planted question from my daughter. No, a planted yeah. question would be um, asking you where I can buy your books. <laughs> um, uh, local bookstores is what I'd recommend first, uh, Audubon Shop, um, uh, the Fat Robin in Hamden, etc. And if you can't find them there, um, it's all over Amazon and Barnes and Noble, etc. So thank you very much, dear. No, I, I have a real question too, though, I um, you have these okay. beautiful shore guides, and I know that you've done so much research uh, do them, how has the changing landscape affected your approach in that? When I first started doing field guides, I always wanted to do field guides. Um, I did not think very deeply about what I was going to see. Uh, uh, but that, that is, um, I'd make a catalog of things and illustrate them or photograph them and put names on them. And that would help people when they're out in wild environments. Um, but very quickly, as I worked, uh, um, say, on the Long Island Sound book, I realized that you can't make sense of what you see uh, unless you know something about the environmental history of the place. Virtually every square inch of the U.S. Atlantic coast uh, has been heavily modified by man 
or is directly influenced by man. And, uh, um, and therefore, I think environmental history is really important. And it's something I emphasize all the time, uh, not just because it helps explain why you're seeing what you're seeing, but also uh, it helps put these wild areas in context because especially along the coast, they're all going to change uh, enormously over the next few decades. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much folks for, for attending. And as my daughter said, buy my book. <laughs> thanks. thanks